Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Unbury Carol by Josh Malaman. So uh, I'm going to read you the blurb as always, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Only three people know Carol Evers' secret. Her best friend, who's dead. Her husband, who hates her. Her ex-lover, who left her. Carol suffers from a dreadful affliction which makes her fall into long comas, waking slumbers indistinguishable from death. Her husband Dwight wants her next death to be her last. He will claim her fortune by pronouncing her dead and burying her alive. The infamous outlaw James Moxie, once Carol's lover, rides the trail again, pursued by murder and mayhem to save the woman he loves. And all the while, Carol is a prisoner in her own body, hearing her funeral plans, summoning every ounce of will to survive. Dark already. So uh, I'm going to read you his bio here because I think what I said, he, he, he's also known for writing Bird Box and basically he's a musician and I think reading Bird Box it felt like reading a book written by a musician, you know, whereas this one felt like reading a book by an accomplished novelist. So Josh Malaman is an international best-selling Bram Stoker Award nominated American author and one of two singer-songwriters for the rock band The High Strung. His debut novel, Bird Box, was published in the United Kingdom and United States in 2014 to much critical acclaim. He lives in Ferndale, Michigan, with his best friend slash soulmate, Alison Larko, and their pets, Frankie, Varlo, Dewey, Marty, and the fish. How come the fish don't have names? So it's got this, like, historically fiction, almost, by... It's kind of hard to tell when it's set, um, but that makes it the more interesting. So we have a great quote here. It was a very delicate business planning a murder, and one had to be very careful what, with what one showed and what one didn't. And Dwight gets angry not because uh, not because this woman he's sort of seeing had suggested killing his wife, but because she'd emasculated him. He's very uh, that's kind of why he wants to get rid of his wife as well because she uh, she's like the one who owns all the money basically. And I thought this is interesting. A guy called Moxie, I think he's the lover, and um, he says uh, Moxie felt the pressure of two days upon him and thought distantly how time, like air, has a way of running out. And that's interesting because that's like the countdown till he can get back to hopefully stop her being buried. And obviously air. Uh, Will run out in her grave. I like the start of this chapter here. We have while Farrell was returning home from mailing her telegram to James Moxie, I think she could hardly believe she did, and I think she wasn't sure why she did, except for a feeling that he should know. Her husband, Clyde, was battling a hangover the enthusiastic way. He was already drinking at the Lamb's Wall. Interesting pub name as well. A lot of people say uh, Hell's Heaven throughout this as well, to the point at which it got a bit a bit distracting. I like this line. It had been over a decade since it would seen him, but a hero is always recognisable to those who adore him. And I like this line as well, like I like the way it contrasts things. Not only had Dwight never hired a man to murder before, he hadn't paid for laundry in almost two decades. Although the rule is supposed to always be not only but also, so that's technically bad writing there. And uh, someone basically gets revealed that somebody killed somebody else in a duel and it was almost as though like he moved so quickly, a lot of people said his hand didn't even move and I have my own theory about uh, what happened there. Another great line of philosophy, everybody's got to use the shitter, he called. Everybody's got to go. I actually shared that one with my friend Jo and she replied to me saying that back in the day when nightclubs were a thing, the girls used to go in and go straight to the bathroom and take toilet paper because they knew that the nightclubs would never replenish the toilet paper as the night went on. I like the way this one guy as well, he he keeps track of all the outlaws basically and the way he does it he assigns them all cards and then the order of the cards is kind of like the order in which they are along the trails and stuff it's very clever as someone says he doesn't drink and then we get there was a moment of bad silence it was just another reason to dislike edward bunny the man never drank never got drunk i don't drink anymore not since september and uh is, is written uh, they're like vampires understand or drunks an outlaw can see himself reflected in the eyes of another no matter how black or gray his heart may be and uh, the sheriff's getting a bit suspicious because Dwight just uh, it doesn't seem angry enough. He just doesn't seem angry enough for be about being questioned, you know? And uh, there's this character called Smoke who's basically this badass and he's lost his legs and somebody chopped them off and it says Gar hadn't just severed his legs, he'd sliced them at the centre of his knees. Ouch. Great quote here. There's a difference between bad and evil, John Bowie once told her. His voice slurred with brandy. Bad is when you ignore the one you love, but evil is when you know exactly what that person wants, what means most to them, and you figure out how to take it away. And uh, her husband, very calculatedly, he purposely does this to make his hair look messy. And he says, how terribly sad, he thought, mimicking the voices of the townspeople. Evers is so distraught, he forgot to comb his hair. And I thought that was just sinister, and it's how calculated it was. Uh, and obviously all this throughout, it, made, it kept making me think, and there's even a quote where she's trying to shout, I'm not dead, and it just reminds me, uh, Granny Weatherwax 
in Terry Pratchett's Discworld. She can go like borrowing so she can inhabit the minds of animals. And when she does that, she leaves a little sign around her neck just says, saying, I ate and dead. And we find out towards the end that Carol's mother had uh, also got the same condition and she'd been working on not necessarily a cure but a backup plan. Uh, but I don't want to let you know how that goes. But uh, overall, as you can tell, I did enjoy this book. I thought it was very well written. Uh, I also liked what I call like the mouthfeel of it and the fact that it was kind of like historical fiction with like magical realism almost in it as well. It was very sort of very unique feeling book. And uh, yeah, well, as I was reading it, it kind of it really came to life in, in front of my mind's eye, I suppose. So I would recommend it. And uh, shout out to Mindy from Mindy's Book Journey, who I buddy read this with. So go and check out her thoughts on it. I gave it a four out of five, and there we have it. So as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye-bye.